Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so a quick bit of background in terms of just how I got to this point while it's this problem. Uh, originally came from sort of a very red teaming offensive security research background at a company called MWR. Okay. Um, I later then sort of moved on to, as part of the founding of Countercept, that was a managed detection response service we launched. So then I kind of went much more into the detection response side. We built our own EDR, so I was doing sort of EDR design techniques, threat hunting research, large-scale data analytics, and that type of thing. And then eventually I joined Push Security, and then had to throw away everything I ever knew in my career, pretty much, because we were focused on like identity and cyber security. Um, and so it was kind of approaching things from a perspective of, well, what happens when you start going after a modern organization that doesn't have any infrastructure, and let's say their endpoints are super hard, and then you can't compromise them. It's just a cloud native, SaaS native company, and felt like I had to kind of start from the ground up again as like a junior, what do I do here? So that's pretty much how I got onto this problem um, originally, was, you know, looking at what does uh, security look like in this kind of new world. So in terms of uh, what we're going to cover in this presentation, like the, we have a sort of brief history of where we, what led to this point, um, briefly look at SaaS adoption, then I'll kind of uh, say what I mean by traditional attacks, and then we'll start going through this, the, the kill chain and look at uh, how the different phases of that have changed slightly in this world, and we'll look at some interesting new techniques as well and how to chain them all together. So um, the way I'm thinking about this now is like if long ago when I first got back into the, in, into the industry in the 2000s, it was pretty much the sort of traditional perimeter hacking time. Um, you know, the techniques of the day were kind of port scanners and vuln scanners and, uh, you know, the response from the industry was kind of bringing in, like, pervasive firewalls and DMZs, network segmentation, patch management, all that sort of thing. And that was, like, an era that then led on to the 2010s where, at a certain point, the endpoint became the new perimeter, and that really shook things up a lot, and everyone started compromising endpoints instead, and then having sort of phishing attacks and malicious office macros, that kind of thing building memory resident implants and command and control frameworks and all that kind of stuff. And that really like bypassed a lot of the old traditional security controls we had. And obviously that's been going on for a long time now. Um, and a big part of that now has been increased endpoint hardening, like the creation of the entire EDR market, which is obviously huge in itself. Um, lots of kind of red teaming and threat hunting teams and that kind of stuff. So that's like quite a mature area now. And so what I was thinking about with this was like fast forward five or 10 years, if I'm looking back at the 2020s, what will be that new thing now? And the way I'm thinking about this now is really, I think cloud identities have become the new perimeter and the question mark is what will the primary techniques of the day end up being and what will be the primary uh, long living response from, from the security industry? So with that in mind, um, one question is like what drives shifts in attacks? So part of that can be um, improved security control. So we kind of covered some of those things before, like you know the, old, the much older things like firewalls and VPNs and patch management were first, and then eventually we had things like EDR and XDR. But obviously, technological shifts are a big part of that too. You don't have to circumvent controls if the technology shifts. So in the long ago, that happened with the introduction of say web apps introduced new attack surface, Wi-Fi introduced a new perimeter. Um, more recently, that's been things like. Um, remote working becoming more common and SaaS native organizations becoming more common. So if the battlefield effectively shifts um, through a technological shift, we have to adapt in the security industry. And I think both of those things have kind of come together uh, more recently with a lot more of a shift towards remote working and, and, and SaaS native organizations, along with you know, pretty mature controls in the response to the sort of endpoint attacks in the past. And from the SaaS adoption perspective, that yeah, this is just it's just becoming more common. I mean, the graphs I got here are kind of a, are actually a couple of years out of date now, but we just saw a massive shift in SaaS adoption. Um, most startups now, a lot of them are, are just SaaS first or SaaS, completely SaaS native. We at Push Security for years now have been completely uh, SaaS native. Uh, we don't have any infrastructure. We're fully remote, no offices. Um, if anything, the only thing we have is like AWS infrastructure to run our products and so forth, but everything else is, is just an app. Um, and in terms of our, even with our customers, if we're looking at sort of bigger enterprise customers, generally people have got, they, they might be migrating a little bit in this space, but when they actually go and look at visibility, you'll find that there's a lot more self-adopted shadow SaaS in place uh, than they will generally realize until they start investigating it by just employees and teams that have signed up for things. 
And it's, so there's actually a huge attack surface there, even among more traditional organizations that, that haven't officially made a big shift into this space yet. So um, from an infrastructure perspective, forgive my very basic <laughs> diagrams here, but how things have been traditionally um, is generally, you know, you've got an internal network, laptops and servers on that. Um, you might have a DMZ that's got some servers that provide some external facing services. Maybe it's something like an application for customers. Maybe it's webmail, um, for example. Then you have remote workers connecting in through a firewall to a VPN, for example, and you have something like that. And then with endpoint compromises, we've generally seen, let's say, some phishing attack compromises an endpoint on the inside that uh, connects out to a command and control server. And you'll have something that looks a little bit like that. But how that's changed with kind of more SaaS native organizations is suddenly you have very hard and endpoints often um, just connecting directly on the internet out to a whole bunch of different SaaS services and cloud services. And additionally, there may be connections between those SaaS services as well with things like OAuth integrations, which we'll come to later. Um, so it's a very different picture. And if you've got a hybrid uh, SaaS organization, you know, you might have a bit of both here where you've got a larger, older company that's kind of midway migrating to this model. Or if you've got a company like like my input security, uh, we'll just have the right-hand side of this graph. So um, approaching this problem to begin with, the first part I sort of started from was even just the sort of kill chain phases. So thinking about like the standard uh, kind of original like Lockheed Martin ones or MITRE um, attack framework ones, I was thinking, does this even work in this space? Like do the phases exist in the same way? Uh, have they changed? Are there new ones? Are some of them are no longer present? Um, I'd say for where I am now, I feel like most of the phases still exist, um, but they might have a slightly different flavor to them. The main thing I'd say that's arguably no longer present is kind of command and control. A lot of that is based around kind of defeating network segmentation and network filtering based controls, and that doesn't really exist in the same way in this new world. So. I'd say that is kind of not really so relevant in this space, but everything else kind of has a parallel now. Um, the most different one is probably execution, but I, there are certain things that I, I still feel fit within that. We'll come to that later. So I kind of started from that very high level phase and then started digging down with, okay, well, what types of attacks fit in with them? Some of those things uh, are very uh, familiar techniques that have been around forever that everyone will be familiar with. Some of them are completely or pretty new. So we'll, we'll cover a bit of both and see how some classic old techniques have changed very slightly. Um, and we'll look at some, some much newer attacks as well. So obviously I haven't got the time to go through every single phrase and every single possible attack. So I've tried to condense things down to a few key phases and a few key examples of things that fit within it to build a, a bigger picture. So we'll start briefly with recon. Um, so, you know, traditionally that might have been things like port scanning, service enumeration, you know, in the, in the sort of pretty old school days. And then, you know, maybe there's a few more things added to that when you're sort of enumerating endpoints and, and client-side software exposure. Um, but in the SaaS native world, this is actually quite different. I think this is much more around SaaS discovery, cloud identity enumeration, SSO enumeration, that sort of thing. So if I'm attacking a cloud native company, I want to know what SaaS services do they use? How do they log into them? What SSO mechanisms do they use? Which ones are protected by SSO? Which ones have effectively local, equivalent of local accounts, but in the cloud? Um, that's the picture I want to build. I'm not looking for IP address space and open ports and so forth. I'm looking for valid cloud identities, valid SaaS tenants, um, and so forth. So there's some really basic things that fit in here. Um, that are very similar to old school techniques like DNS brute forcing or that kind of thing. Um, one of them is SAML enumeration. So like if, if an organization is kind of following good security practice and they want to link in their SAS apps to their SSO provider, they might use SAML as a mechanism for doing that. Um, but that often means that's a way of identifying both that they use a particular SAS application and what their SSO endpoint is. So I'm just using RAMP as an example here. Um, I'm using just test.com as a domain, and I'm using a, a customer that's acknowledged on their website, Webflow. And you can see how you get a different response coming back uh, when going through the login process there. And then um, that enables you to identify their Okta endpoint, where they use as their SSO provider. So in doing that, you can identify both that they use this app application and what their SSO endpoint is. And that also applies to lots of different SaaS apps. That's like one very basic kind of recon type technique. Um, other things are something called slug tenant enumeration. Often you have to 
it's called pick a, a, a slug name for a tenant when you sign up for an app. It depends on the app itself. Some follow different models, but often you have to give it a name. It's a little bit like registering a domain name. Um, there's no guarantee that if you find a name registered that it was definitely the company themselves that did it. Anyone can register a name a little bit like domains, but it's a good indicator. So like here, just used, again, another publicly acknowledged customer of, of Bamboo, an HR application. And you can see the difference in response between an invalid customer or a legitimate one like SoundCloud. So then I can get a feeling that they, you know, they may be a customer, may, may use that application. And in this case, it also then takes me to their, to their uh, login portal where I can then see, oh, they've configured it to allow social logins via Google, as well as local logins using username and password. Again, that gives me a feel for their SSO as well. That's another common technique that applies to lots of different SaaS applications. Very basic things, but they're, they're useful recon techniques. Okay, so moving on now to a bit of a bigger area. Initial access is obviously always a very key part of the kill chain. Um, so, you know, on the sort of endpoint side of things, I'd normally be thinking of phishing attacks and but aimed at endpoint compromises. So, you know, malicious office macros or whatever the case is. Um, gaining a beachhead by having a compromised endpoint on the internal network and moving from there. Now, obviously, in the SaaS native space, we're kind of assuming we can't compromise an endpoint. Um, what do we do from this point? So what does initial access look like? Um, now, there are some kind of traditional things, the traditional attacks that you'd be familiar with, but slightly new flavors that, that are affected here, and there's some much newer techniques, too, that we'll come to. So it can be things as simple as just like credential stuffing and password guessing. Um, it can be slightly newer varieties of phishing, things like consent phishing, or just different delivery vectors, like instant messenger applications as opposed to email, um, or using like attacker in the middle proxy techniques uh, to sort of handle MFA responses and so forth, and kind of focused on gaining some kind of cloud identity compromise, so like getting um, some kind of control over one or more accounts on one or more different SaaS applications as your beachhead as an alternative to the, you know, the previous a technique of gaining an endpoint compromise. So we look at something like credential stuffing. Um, before, normally, we'd only have one or two endpoints to, or to, to try this against. But maybe we'd have a webmail endpoint or a VPN endpoint or something. It'd be quite a tightly well-controlled um, gateway into the to organization if we were doing something simple like password guessing or trying existing creds. This actually has changed quite a lot in the SaaS world because often applications are not protected by SSO. You might find some of the core um, SaaS applications have been protected by SSO, things that have been involved with, with IT teams setting up and so forth, but not even all SaaS applications support SSO. Like quite a large proportion of them just require you to have local accounts. And obviously anything that's kind of signed up for by users on their own without talking to IT is not going to generally have SSO. So for a start, you end up having a lot of different endpoints you can try. Um, these attacks against. They may not be anywhere near as well protected from a password policy or account lockout or MFA perspective. You know, it may offer authentication, no lockout, um, maybe weak passwords were used by the users. So in this case, you've actually got a lot of different endpoints you can potentially try against, and you may then have weak accounts falling out in various different places. So maybe you don't get some nice core juicy SSO compromises of a um, of a core identity provider for an organization, but maybe you find, oh, I found this weak account that's valid for Make, this one for Dropbox, this one for Zapier, and that's your sort of beachhead. You get some small level of access into different applications in use by the organization. So in a way, it's actually kind of amplified the risk of this like very old school, oldest time um, technique because of the nature of the way these applications tend to work and how people tend to sign up for them and access them. On the other hand, consent phishing is a little bit different because here we are, we're not looking for creds, we're not looking for MFA, we're just looking to trick a user into delegating access to permissions using OAuth. Um, so we can set up a malicious OAuth app and we can send consent phishing links to users and it has the benefit of using legitimate URLs, like it'll be a legitimate Microsoft URL or a legitimate Google URL, whatever the case is, whatever you're trying to delegate against. Um, it's also useful because it grants permanent access because it's a delegated permission model thing. It's not, you're not getting a temporary password or a one-time MFA login. You're just getting permanent access via an API and they can go and change their password or reset their MFA. And it doesn't normally make a difference once you've got access unless someone revokes the OAuth access specifically, you maintain those privileges. So in this case, you know, I'm saying I'm 
use an example here where I'm looking for delegated access to someone's files in OneDrive and for their, uh, their emails and so forth. And that's another phishing technique that then applies pretty well in this space and defeats you know, common controls um, like MFA. Another thing is just the vectors. As I mentioned before, like I think obviously instant messenger applications have been pretty pervasive for a while now, but they started out very internally focused, and email has always been the sort of cross-company collaboration tool, and so a lot of phishing kind of stuck to, to email as a platform. But obviously, email is old-fashioned. IM is so useful. Um, we ended up having things like Slack Connect introduced and like eventually Microsoft Teams external access. And now we've got ways of collaborating between customers on these platforms. And it's kind of introduced new vectors for phishing. And even from an awareness perspective, like I think a lot of outside of the security industry, like a lot of general users are just nowhere near as familiar with receiving phishing threats in applications that they see as trusted, like internal collaboration tools compared with email. So, you know, you've got some pretty good spoofing options with things like Slack and Teams. You know, you can set up a new organization, name it what you want, name your users what you want, use whatever pitches you like, and try and um, Slack connect to someone, for example, or do a Teams connect. Uh, and then you've got, you know, real-time IM chatting where you can get a lot of uh, pretext going before you drop your malicious link later. And even talking about link handling, there's pretty good, interesting options in IAM applications. We'll see there's been a lot of work with email applications in the past to make link handling um, quite a uh, well-secured feature in terms of like making sure obvious ways of hiding links or obfuscating them in certain ways are kind of dealt with and there's a lot of analysis going on, but those things just don't necessarily exist on IAM platforms or many other platforms that support links. So I've got an example at the bottom there of something that just looks like a link to something on my blog, but that's just using a link preview spoofing technique. So when Slack connects to get a preview, I send that blog. When the user clicks the link, I send them to my phishing site. Um, so those kind of things can be pretty useful as well. So it's just a new vector, and it opens up a lot more possibilities. Um, OK, so they're all like slightly new flavors of oldest time techniques that everyone's seen a million times. I'm now going to move on to some slightly newer ones. Uh, one interesting one, I sort of I've kind of been calling poison tenants. Um, and the idea here is that rather than attack an organization's legitimate SaaS tenants to, to try and gain access, you set up malicious tenants and use them to attack uh, an organization's users. So I can set up a tenant on a SaaS application. I then get you know legitimate domain that, that, that runs that tenant. Um, and the idea then is kind of socially engineering users to use it in some way. Now, depending on what you try and do, this can either be completely unrealistic or very realistic. Like, I would love to be able to target, uh, you know, like a huge bank and convince them to use my Slack tenant and then have access to all the email, uh, all the messages because I'm an admin. Um, that's not realistic, obviously. But for, depending on the organization and the SaaS application in, in question, it can be more realistic in other scenarios. So, you know, it could be that I know the marketing team, marketing team are looking to use a new application for some particular purpose and I can use that as a pretext in social engineering early and then I can set up a tenant and start using legitimate email invite functionality to just invite their users. They'll get emails not from me, they'll get emails from the SaaS application provider. So they look a lot more legitimate. In this case, I've just got an example with Nucleino, which is a SaaS based wiki. Um, if you can get people onto your system then, then you might uh, you build a critical mass of a certain team and just leave them using it. Once people are using it, it's just there. Now, either it could be an application where it's interesting to you because of what information they'll start putting into it, and that's more of a direct attack, or it could be something that serves no real purpose for you on its own. It could be a gift generator, you know. Um, but it might be something that allows you to launch other attacks in future, so it's like a first stage. Um, so we're going to look at that. Uh, by combining it with another technique called sample jacking. Um, so sample jacking is another case of like abusing something legitimate. Uh, SAML is a great technology for integrating SSO, but what it does mean is that many SaaS applications, or at least the ones that support it, enable an admin to com effectively configure a URL to be re redirected to during the login process, because that's how SAML works. So if I set up a malicious tenant, and I set up um, an evil SAML server, doing, or any, you know, any domain, I can make a legitimate SaaS web domain 
redirect to my domain during the login process, which is pretty good for tricking users during phishing because the first domain they're going to look at when they're assessing a link is a completely legitimate SAS app. And it's only after that they'll get redirected. So here I'm configuring Nucleino, and then what happens is if I send them to my Nucleino tenant, they'll get a login page like this where it's like, oh, your tenant's been configured for SSO. Like, click the button here to log in with SSO. So they've already assessed the link at that point. They're happy it's a legitimate Nucleino link. Then they click the button. Then they get redirected to my, in this case, Google Workspace phishing page, which I could then use as a maybe attack in the, attacker in the middle proxy if I'm attacking someone that uses Google Workspace as their SSO provider. Equally, I could do this with Okta or Azure or whatever I want. But it's just from a, tricking, from a trickery perspective, you're sort of bypassing that initial check, and then you're redirecting them later during the login process when they're expecting to be prompted for creds. So it's pretty good for um, for catching people out. It's kind of, I mean, you, you, I feel like I could fill for this. And I'm a security guy, so like, um, it's you know, it's a pretty useful technique. And where it gets really interesting is if you combine it with poison tenants, for example, as well. So demo gets a little bit complicated, so I've just pre-recorded one um, with my narration. So I'm just going to step back and let it play uh, for a while. For step one of the attack. We've set up a poison tenant in Nucleino, and we're now going to use the built-in email invite functionality to invite our target users. We enter their email address, we click to invite, and then Nucleino will send an email to that user from its own domains, inviting them to our poison tenant. If we then look at our team settings, we'll see that there is a pending invite for that user waiting for them to respond to the invite they've had. For step two of the attack, we're going to look at the target user now who's received the email invite from Nucleino. And we can see that it's from a legitimate Nucleino domain, uh, not from an attacker controlled domain. So when the target user clicks the button to join, they're then prompted to enter their details uh, in order to create an account as the first step. And once they've done that, so basically a one-step process, they then have an account with Nucleino and they are then automatically joined to the poison tenant. For the final step of the attack chain, we will look at the SAML jacking portion. Here we are looking at the configuration panel for SSO settings for the poison tenant. We've configured them to point to an NGROC domain that we control for testing purposes. Obviously an attacker could register a more convincing domain if they so wish. We are now going to click to enforce SSO logins, which will result in Nucleino prompting existing users by email to link their accounts to their SSO identity. Looking at the email the target receives, we can see it's a legitimate email from Nucleino domains with a link that points to a Nucleino domain, so there's no real cause for suspicion. The first path to compromise is if the target responds to this email directly. Clicking the button in the email, we can see we are immediately redirected to our malicious SSO server, and that shows us a fake Google login page in this case. If the user enters their credentials here, then the attack is complete. Alternatively, the target may not see the email or may not immediately respond to it and continue to use their authenticated session with Nucleino. Eventually, this session will expire, which we are going to simulate in this case just by logging out. This will cause existing tabs and links to redirect back to the tenant-specific login page. We can see this now has a large button prompting to login via SSO. If the user clicks this button to log in now, then they are immediately directed to our malicious SSO page where they can enter their credentials for capture. Okay. All right, so you can see how when you combine things like that together, they can get quite powerful and pretty sneaky. Um, there's more I could talk about in the initial access front, but we'll move on to another phase now, persistence, which is really interesting in the SaaS world from my perspective. Um, in an endpoint world with persistence, I'd normally be thinking about how you maintain access to particular compromised endpoints. Uh, at least with Windows, traditionally, you know, you're talking about things like run keys, scheduled tasks, services. I mean, there's about a million ways you can do it on Windows, but those kind of things. Um, in the SaaS native space, though, it's quite different. Uh, we're talking about how do you maintain access to a SaaS application. Um, and there's various ways you can do that. There's things like we can use OAuth to do that. And we'll look at that. It's not just for consent phishing. Uh, you can use it for persistence, too. There's really simple techniques, things like API keys, link sharing, something I'm calling ghost logins. So we'll come to that. 
if you get down to the sort of equivalent of a domain compromise, like you've compromised an IDP, uh, rather than make golden tickets and stuff, you can do things like inbound federation, where you just set up an external identity provider that then enables you to use your own SAML server to authenticate in future. So there's lots of different techniques here. Um, and then some of them are actually pretty difficult to recover from as well. Um, so we'll go through some of the basic ones here. Link sharing, I'm sure you've probably all seen it with things like OneDrive and Google Drive. If you want to share a file, but with an, ex someone, an external organization, they don't have an account on your platform, you can make a, a shareable link. So it's an unguessable URL. So someone can only access it if they no have knowledge of the URL. Um, but what that does is it disconnects it from the account. So uh, as an attacker, if I compromise a user, I could go and just share everything they have access to, document all the sharing links. And then if I'm kicked out of that account, or even if, even if I'm a malicious insider and I'm about to be fired, and my account is going to no longer exist tomorrow, I, disc, I can sort of decouple that from the account itself and just create sharing links and then maintain access to them. And it's, people are not really used to looking for that. At least for things like OneDrive and Google Drive, you can generally see when something's shared. But I mean, you can just share like a root folder and then you maintain access through that folder. Um, but there's loads of other platforms that support it as well. I mean, I've got an example down there of using it with Nucleano, but often ticketing systems have it for sharing tickets. It's, it's really common functionality. And it's often really not obvious when people have done it, unless you're really digging down to logs and configuration settings. So we're like, with Nucleano, you have to like literally go into every individual thing to check it. You can probably do it by the API as well, but I mean, no one's doing that. So you could compromise Nucleano create your own API key for it, which we'll come to, then automate sharing everything on the wiki, maintain all those links, no one will probably notice, and then, you know, that's it. It's decoupled from the user account. So it's not just, uh, you know, obviously it will persist past password changes and so forth, but it will also persist past the, even the existence of the user as well. So really basic, but it's actually quite a painful persistence technique and quite hard to recover from, because you can do it on multiple apps as well. So API keys, yeah, another one. It's not just admins that can create API keys. A lot of SaaS applications allow users to do it and then offer most of, if not all, of their functionality via an API as well. This is me using Shortcut, a ticket in this system we use. Just create an API key and then, great, I've got access to all the functionality via Shortcut. I don't need the password or MFA token anymore. Ghost logins is similar, but where you can actually account, it's a net, catchy name I came up with, 4, 4X. I was trying to decide what to call it. Uh, there's various different iterations of it. Generally, it means when you can configure more than one particular cloud identity or like user account in some way to access the same underlying SaaS account. So it could be you use a SAML login or a social login normally, but the local accounts that exist and can have a password set if you want to. So for example, shortcut ticket system is the top left one there. I socially log in, but if I want to, I can set a local password. So if I compromise that account and some users normally using a Google social login, I can go and set a password. They can carry on using their Google social login. I can carry on using the local password. We can both coexist. It's persistence. Um, you can also do it by linking other social accounts quite often. So if this and that is one is the top right example there, maybe someone's already using Google as the social login, but I can go and link a Facebook account or an Apple account I control, and they can then both access the account. So if they don't go look for that, it's another way of maintaining access. Or it can be as simple as just secondary logins. So Expensify is one example down there. Someone has a primary, I could just go and add a secondary. So the general idea is you can make more than one account um, or, or more than one cloud, cloud identity be able to access the same underlying SaaS account. And that's a really good persistence option too. Um, and I think where it really gets interesting with this is that you know, a user might have 30 SaaS apps or 50 SaaS apps. Depends on how heavy a user they are. I think uh, it, at Push, I think our CEO has got something like 70 or 80 alone. Um, this is not like one endpoint that you need to clean up from. Like if you detect a compromise and it's been caught early with a low privileged user, normally you're like, okay, disconnect the endpoint, like reset their account, let's investigate that, let's give them a clean build. Even a small compromise with that, it could affect 50 applications you've then got to go and investigate for persistence. So it's a real nightmare. Um, I wouldn't want to be an IR in this type of thing, to be honest. Um, but the next one, okay, they were really basic examples. When I look at OAuth, a uh, slightly more complicated example. As I said before, 
We looked at it briefly with consent phishing uh, in the security space, and most of the time find OAuth um, referenced in regards to consent phishing. But it's actually a really useful persistence technique as well, and there's a few different ways you can use it. So the classic is the most similar to consent phishing, where you go and make your own custom OAuth application. And the difference is, because you're already controlling an account you've compromised, you don't need to trick a user into consenting to it. You just go and consent to it yourself. And then you maintain access that way. So you basically delegate privileges on that account to, to your app. And then it doesn't matter. They can change their password after that or MFA. You just maintain access via your OAuth app. That's really similar to consent phishing. It's just that you do the, the consent yourself. Um, but you know, if someone's more advanced and they're going out looking for malicious OAuth apps, uh, you know, if you've got a security team doing that, they might find, hmm, what's this weird, strange OAuth app that's appeared on our organization, consented for by these couple of users that I'm Googling it and never seen the application ID before. You know, it's a little easier to, to find if you're looking for it. But you, in a persistence example, you can actually do a hide in plain sight approach too. So for example, you could use legitimate SaaS apps. Um, so I'm just using Canva as an example here. Uh, but let's say I create my own Canva account and I then connect it to the OneDrive of the, the account I've compromised. Then Canva's connected. It's a completely legitimate OAuth integration. Maybe the organization already uses Canva. Maybe the user themselves already uses Canva. But then I've got whatever functionality Canva offers of me via that OAuth integration. In this case, I'm able to browse the file system through Canva. So I'm limited by what Canva or any SaaS application I use for this offers me. So it's not perfect. But the point is, if a, if a security person's going and investigating things, they've got to then determine that this is a legitimate application being misused. And that's where it gets a little tricky. Or the third option is you can impersonate client-side apps. So some OAuth is done rather than be done with secrets from the server side that you wouldn't have access to, like Canberra, for example. Um, it's, it's actually done for things like mobile apps or mail clients where you can't protect the secrets. Um, and there are different flows in OAuth intended for this. Um, but ultimately, that does still give you something else you can impersonate. So for example, I use Thunderbird as an example here. I just took the secrets out of the code base, impersonated the, Thunder app, the Thunderbird app, and then you don't even have to live with the permissions it normally accesses. I mean, Thunderbird normally accesses email and calendar, which is pretty useful anyway. But I've just gone and added like loads more. You can still do that. Uh, then I can use the API just like I would for a customer OAuth app. But if someone goes and looks at the uh, OAuth apps connected, they're going to find Thunderbird. And may, you know, especially if the user already uses that, it's going to look legitimate if they Google it. It's, oh, it's a legitimate app again. You kind of get the best of both worlds to some extent with this approach. You kind of get pretty flexible control while still being able to sort of impersonate something that looks a bit more legitimate. Now, you wouldn't be able to use that for consent phishing because you don't control the callback URLs. But for, for persistence, you can do it via local host, and that's always permitted. So it's like a little exception to that. OK, moving on to the execution phase. This is the one I said before that, to begin with, I was like, maybe, maybe this doesn't exist anymore. Because traditionally, I'm thinking native code running or like malicious uh, scripting languages like offensive PowerShell, or VBScript, or whatever, memory resident implants, all that sort of thing. Pretty much the SaaS world is based on you not running code. It's based on someone else providing functionality to you, and you never run in your own code or your own containers. So I was like, well, maybe it doesn't exist. But actually, there are some SaaS applications that are almost like the PowerShell of the SaaS world. Um, and I think they fit into this space. So there's like automation platforms, things like no-code automation, low-code automation. Um, they are the best example here. You could kind of argue OAuth is a little bit in this space because you get an API key and then you can do what you want from your own code. But it's a, a bit of a blurry one, that. But definitely automation platforms fit in this space. So I've been calling this shadow workflows, the idea of making an automation workflow that's, that's malicious. Um, it's the most code execution-like technique that I've kind of seen in this in this new space. Um, I pretty much think this could become the offensive power shell of the SaaS world, really, because it's so powerful. Um, and even recently, since I've done this research, I've realized I've seen a reference to Scattered Spider and Oxy Tempest using Fivetran. Fivetran is not one I've tested or was familiar with. In fact, I only found out about it when I read about this, but it's a similar platform. Uh, it's a data automation, data movement platform, and there was reference in a Microsoft article to Scattered Spider do, using it to steal send desk databases and some other database, Salesforce databases maybe. 
but, but basically there's lots of them and most of them they're, they're, it's like coding um, like easy coding uh, no code kind of type stuff you make a trigger for something and you make an action so you could say whenever I receive this email in my OneDrive take the email and upload it to my Google Drive or, or something and you can make them quite complicated if you want or you can make very basic ones um, but they're really powerful because via OAuth they connect to almost anything and then you can make custom logic for doing whatever you want so we're going to see that in more detail in a minute, so just hold the thought on the shadow workflows because we're going to see a video. But I'm going to combine it with something that's in another phase, the defense evasion phase, which I'm calling evil twin integrations. And this is where we're coming back to OAuth again. But um, most of uh, the automation workflow platforms use OAuth as the, as the method to connect to different SaaS apps. Now, I said before, whether it's a custom OAuth app you've made yourself for malicious purposes or a, you know, something where you're trying to hide in plain sight like Canva or Thunderbird. If it's a new consent or a new or an application that's not been used in the organization before, there should be logs that relate to that. So I'm using Microsoft as an example here. Um, if someone's never used Zapier before and someone in the organization makes an OAuth integration via it and the security team's paying attention to that, hopefully they'll get an alert and be like, Zapier's come up. And then they can decide to approve that or not if they want to. Um, and additionally, if they want to go a step further, if further users start using it, they could still get an alert every time a new user delegates permissions. But once a user has delegated access, it won't happen again. So if I find a user that's already integrated Zapier, an automation workflow platform, and already agreed to file an email access, they use it legitimately, I could set up a different Zapier tenant, my own Zapier tenant I control, connect it to that user account with the same permissions, and it won't necessarily come up with it as a new consent because that user's already consented those permissions. And at that point, it's actually really difficult from logs to see that there's, there's technically two different Zapiers accessing, accessing your data. Because from your perspective, it's just the same Zapier OAuth integration. You can't really tell that it's two different tenants, that there's your legit corporate one and there's my malicious one on the side. So it's a really sneaky um, kind of defense evasion technique for making it hard to see that someone's kind of replicated some access in a different platform they control. But anyway, it'll make more sense when you see the video. So same as before. To demonstrate our shadow workflow and evil twin integration attack, we begin the journey by being logged in as our compromised Azure account. We don't want to lose access to this account, so we are seeking to backdoor the account to maintain persistent access beyond password changes, MFA resets, or similar response activities. The first step is to enumerate existing OAuth integrations to identify potential targets for an evil twin integration. In this example, we will use the simple GUI option of browsing the apps list in the Microsoft My Apps dashboard. Here we can see there are multiple different Zapier integrations. Zapier is a powerful SaaS automation app and a great potential target. We'll look at what permissions have been granted. Looking at the Zapier to do app, we can see it's been granted permissions for file access, which is very useful to us. If we switch to the Zapier Outlook integration, we can see this has been granted access to email as well, another really useful capability. Okay. So it looks like the compromised user was making use of Zapier. Before we jump to creating our own shadow workflows, let's see if we can scope out their account to understand it better. If they've been following good security practices, they probably log in via SSO or social login. So we may just be able to log in directly with their Azure account. Let's give that a try. Okay, so it worked and we are now in their Zapier account. Let's check out their automation workflows known as Zaps in Zapier to see what they were doing. It looks like they have one set up for forwarding expenses that connects their Outlook to their OneDrive. That explains the file and email permissions we saw earlier. Let's double check the integrations to check they look good. Okay, we can see active OneDrive and Outlook connections and they're for the correct user account. All looks good. At this point, we could backdoor the existing expenses workflow or we could create a new one and possibly hide it in a different folder. However, there is always the chance that the user may discover this later, and we may get locked out of the Zapier account too. Instead, we are going to create an evil twin integration using a separate Zapier account that only we control. To do that, we'll first sign up for a new Zapier account using our own Google account. Now that we have a new Zapier account, 
We'll create a new Zap to automatically forward new files in their OneDrive to our own Google Drive account. To do that, we'll create a OneDrive trigger on a new file and connect it to their Azure account. We won't need to consent to any Azure permissions as they have already been granted access by the user previously. Then for the action, we'll select Google Drive and set it to upload a file and connect it to our own Google account and consent for Zapier to access it. The end result will be that Zapier monitors the compromised user's OneDrive in the background and then copies any new files and uploads them to our own Google Drive. Let's publish that and then see it in action. We'll head back to OneDrive and create a new confidential file as a test. Now that's created, we'll head over to our own Google Drive and wait. And there we go, the file has appeared. Our shadow workflow is doing its job. And because we made it an evil twin integration, there will be no logs showing a new application consent or any new permission grants either. Even when the user changes their password, we can go back to our Zapier account and create new shadow workflows using the existing integrations to perform new tasks as well. All things considered, this is a very powerful attack chain. Okay, so yeah, I mean, that's a pretty powerful technique. Um, and then you've got what uh, access going into your tenant from Zapier, something that you're already observing coming from Zapier's IP addresses. Zapier's doing everything for you. Um, you can even go and make new Zaps using the existing connections with different functionality. So I could do it, you know, I could then make one to go and grab their emails and send it to some other location as well. So you can change that after the fact, even if you've been kicked out of the original Azure account later. So you combine those kind of things together and it's a damn fine execution-like technique that's also a very stealthy persistence method. Um, and yeah, I've since seen that apparently similar things have, have been used by Scattered Spider as well. So it's pretty interesting. Um, but moving on to the next phase, lateral movement. So what does um, lateral movement look like in this new world? Because traditionally I'd be saying, okay, this is very infrastructure focused. It's I've compromised this endpoint and I want to move to another endpoint or a server or I've compromised a server, I want to move to a different server, it tends to be that. I mean, I guess there is account-based stuff as well with things like Active Directory kind of enumeration and, and, and moving around there. But it tends to be focused on that. In the SaaS world, we're talking about moving between, either between SaaS apps, so I've gained access to SaaS app A, can I somehow get to SaaS app B, or the cloud identities that link them together. Um, it tends to be more focused on that because obviously we, we don't have the same infrastructure parallel. So in terms of like techniques in the past, you know, that might be things like credential dumping, remote service creation, software deployment tools, however you move between bits of infrastructure. Uh, in the SaaS native world, it can be really simple things like link backdooring on trusted systems, or it can be abusing account recovery processes through email, or it can be abusing existing OAuth integrations we gain access to. So we'll kind of see something similar to what we've seen before, but from a slightly different angle for lateral movement. So link backdooring, again, this is a, something really basic and it's just a slightly new flavor, but there's so many places where on trusted systems, it has applications where you might be able to put links and it's not somewhere people are expecting to be fished, like on a wiki, um, on ticketing systems, whatever. That, that kind of, it's more of a watering hole technique. And again, they, they don't not often have the same level of controls in place around malicious links, like things like emails and web mail gateways will provide. So this is just an example using the Clino wiki, but you know, like I could have a legitimate link here um, where I've got text going to a Google link, that's legitimate. Or I could try and fake the Google link, but obviously, you know, um, you must, you know, an observant user may still see that once they go to click it, they see it's a different link. Or you can just do simple things like take advantage of shortened paths to uh, make something not obvious that it's a malicious link at the first glance there because you made a long link and you've got your own domain, you make use of subdomains on that to hide the fact that the end of the link has changed. And that's really common on platforms like this is having these sort of preview things because they're just not somewhere people are used to being fished. So the malicious example here is, let's say you compromise a user account and you gain access to their wiki like this. You could create an API key on Nucleino um, you could then take a shotgun approach if you want and just go and backdoor every single link that is writable to the user on the wiki with something subtle that then means it directs to your attacker in the middle, like phishing page, 
proxy or something and then watch the credentials and sessions come in as people click on things. Or you could be retargeted. You could say, I want to get access to their AWS. And you find the account page that says what a new user has to go through when they join on the development team and gain access to their AWS environment. And you subtly just change, you know, backdoor the links that are of most interest to you. And you wait a month till they get a new joiner. And then you get your AWS access, whatever the case. Um, basic stuff, but there's just a lot of places in SaaS applications that, that this is a, a good technique for kind of putting things in place to laterally move later between different accounts and systems. Um, account recovery, again, another really basic one, but if you gain access to email, either because you've compromised a core SSO account that enables you access to, to, to email, or maybe you've done a consent phishing attack that has granted you email access, or there's some other way you've gained access to an inbox. There's so many other SaaS applications you can then move to because if you gain access to that email, often it's, it's almost like a hub and spoke model. If you've got access to a core SSO type account, there's so many other applications you can move to, and email is one of them. So it could be just password resets, or it could be uh, things like passwordless logins, like Canva does that by default. Uh, so if you've not configured MFA on Canva, it will do one-time passwords as a single factor via email. So you could log in via that, those means. Um, there's lots of options via email for abusing account recovery processes to move to different accounts or different SaaS applications. Or you can abuse existing OAuth integrations. So I'm going to use some familiar examples here with a slightly different take. We looked at Canva and Zapier before from the perspective of configuring our own things where we've already compromised the account. But let's say, let's say a user signed up for Canva or Zapier once, uh, self-signed up, set a weak password, no MFA, um, playing around with it, you know, just to test it out, wasn't worried. Then they were like, oh, I connected to my OneDrive check that feature out. So then they did that. Then maybe they forgot about the account, didn't end up using it, or maybe they still use it, but whatever, they didn't close it down. I then compromise that through something basic, like a credential stuffing attack. But then I get in and I find it's got pre-existing integrations. I can then move from that account. You know, I can then abuse that OneDrive access in Canva to, to leverage access there. Or Zapier is a goldmine. If I compromise that unprotected Zapier account, suddenly I've got Google Drive and one Microsoft Outlook connections, and I can basically make my own custom code to do anything I want. So that's a common sort of um, paradigm in this world, I think, for lateral movement, is gaining access to certain systems where there's been links, normally via OAuth, configured to different accounts or different SaaS apps. Uh, and that's a common technique in this space, too. OK, look, I've been through quite a lot, and I appreciate I've whizzed over quite a lot of things. I could probably speak all day about this topic if I wanted to. Um, but there's only so much time in one presentation. Um, but as part of this, I kind of put together a sort of MITRE style, attack framework type style um, attack matrix, but specifically for these kind of SaaS native, cloud native attacks. It's on GitHub. Um, this is a sort of list that I put together, but each one has a basic write up. So if you want to know more about this, go and check that out. Uh, I released it back in oh, July, August sort of time. I can't remember the exact date now, but I try and keep it up to date with new things and new examples. So for each of those things, um, I tend to have, like this is just an example, basic write-ups to give a basic idea of what, what they are. Uh, you know, references where possible, but I tend to try to keep an, like, an example or two of a SaaS application where it applies. So you can see some real-world examples too. Um, so check that out if that's of interest to you. Um, additionally, I've sort of done a bunch of deep, deep dive blog posts on this, if you want to know some of the more detail, because that sort of covers the high level and basic sort of documentation. But there's a whole bunch of blog posts I've done related to this too. So like both those videos I showed before are actually embedded as part of blog posts covering that as well. So they're, they're the two at the bottom there, the Samuel Jacking of Poison Tenant and the Shadow Workflows Evil Twin. But I've done some other ones as well. I've done a whole bunch of stuff on using phishing, like Slack as a phishing platform and Teams as a phishing platform and some of the interesting things you can do. Uh, a lot more detail than what I covered on that earlier. Um, and also, more recently, I've done some Okta-related ones to um, sort of doing SAML jacking for Okta-type stuff and, and like extracting credentials from Okta via Okta's SWA as well. So like, if those things are of interest, check those out. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I'd say I've covered a lot. What are the key takeaways here? I think, for me, like, the world is already hybrid SaaS. Um, even the large enterprises now, everyone's got some SaaS exposure. It's normally way bigger than what they realize, unless 
they've started looking into it a lot as well because there's so much self-adopted SaaS out there. Most SaaS applications, they're, they're marketing models, they're product-led growth models where they encourage people to self-sign up and just start using it. Um, so, you know, people in large organizations suffering bureaucracy, they end up just going and doing things that maybe they shouldn't do, but they find a tool that solves their problem and they go and use it. Um, it's not unusual for us to find literally hundreds of SaaS applications in use in large organizations when they were aware of like 10 or 20. Uh, so I think really everyone's pretty much hybrid SaaS at this point and the newer companies out there are pretty much SaaS native. Like, you know, we're, my company, Push, we're, we're SaaS native. And in five years time, you know, there's going to be startups like that that are huge companies too. Uh, and they're probably not going to stop being like that. So. I think the world has already shifted here. Um, this isn't a tomorrow problem. This is already a today problem. Uh, the other takeaway is that you know, there's many SaaS orientated attack techniques that do not require endpoint compromises. Now, if you mix in endpoint compromises as well, that, op you know, that opens up um, a gateway to other attacks too. But I deliberately focused this research on saying, OK, let's pretend you know, that they're gone and I can't use those. Let's see what this world looks like in a kind of no endpoint compromise scenario. Um, and you know, the position I got to is that, yeah, there's like lots of effective techniques here across the whole kill chain that you can use to compromise an entire organization without touching the endpoint. Um, so that's another takeaway. Um, if you're say, I don't know, like a red teamer or an IR person, uh, you're mostly focused on sort of traditional endpoint compromises and stuff, but you just want to dip your toe into this, I'd probably recommend just checking out maybe persistence is the first thing because I think it opens up a whole new world in this space, particularly incident responders need to be aware of this because I haven't got any good answers for the persistence bit yet, but there's, a, there's so much you can do and um, I think it's pretty hard to recover from because you've got... So before, if someone compromises a whole Windows domain, yes, it's a nightmare to recover from, yeah? But ideally, you stop them from getting that far in the first place. Um, Individual endpoint compromises, though, if you've got good processes in place, are a bit more manageable. The problem with this now is that even individual cloud identity compromises can affect lots of different SaaS apps. And then, you know, you need to be able to know how to audit every single one of those and look for potential persistence methods. It's, it's pretty tricky, and I think there's probably going to need to be a bit of work in that space. Um, and otherwise, I think just if you're a red or blue teamer generally, you know, check this out. If, you're, if you've got a red team coming up against a a mostly SaaS native company and you haven't done that before, check this out. Um, if you're working for, you know, in defense for a company like that, check this out, see if it's of use. Um, and beyond that, just a couple more things I just literally added last night because uh, some things have happened uh, that are quite interesting since I first did some of this work. I think even while I've been doing this research, um, this space has evolved so rapidly. Um, and like now, uh, it went from before I started it being thinking like mm, this is going to have this type of stuff's going to have to happen, I guess. But is it possible? I don't know. Then I kind of did a load of research and started thinking, okay, uh, these there are practical ways of doing all this. But is anyone doing it? Uh, then I've since heard of like examples of red teams doing some of this stuff, and now even publicly acknowledged examples of real threat actors moving into this space, like Scattered Spider and Octa Tempest, are definitely doing things in this space. There's some things that are public. I've heard a lot more privately. And even things like recently, like the Microsoft breach that's been disclosed, like Midnight Blizzard, APT29, it's still only a small fraction of the wider space that I've covered here, but you know, they've done some big compromises where they weren't going after endpoints at all. It was very much like cred stuffing a test Azure tenant, move it, last removing from that one to another one, setting up some malicious OAuth apps. This is happening now. Uh, this is not a tomorrow problem. It's a, it's a today problem. Um, big question is what to do about it. Uh, you know, so I'm now kind of busy on, on researching uh, the sort of detection and response side for it as well. Um, but it's at this point, I think we're seeing a, you know, a kind of major shift in the technological landscape and, and what the threat looks like going forward. So I think a lot's going to happen in the next year or two. We're going to see attacks evolving a lot. And so I think at this point, just being, a, you know, being aware of it and starting to consider this is, is, is really important. Um, Okay, and that's it. So if you want any more information, check out the SAS Attacks Matrix on GitHub or check out our blog post on our website or come talk to me uh, at some point today. Um, thank you.
Okay, so you're, yeah, you're asking whether some of those privileged actions could be linked up to YubiKeys or something. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of that because, I mean, a lot of those kind of more advanced controls, I mean, like we use YubiKeys in, in push, but it, they're often linked to the sort of biggest tech vendors like, you know, your Googles and your Microsofts and, and those kind of things for the key authentication mechanisms. But I just don't think that so widely support. I mean, I guess GitHub as well. We use them for like commits, signing commits and stuff. But the wider level of support in SaaS apps, I, I just don't think is there for advanced things like that, sadly. I mean, say like literally not even all SaaS apps support SSO. Some, I can't remember the stat when we last looked into it, but it was something like 50-50. So if like after this long, if that many won't even support linking a social login or a SAML login, then unfortunately I don't think the more advanced things like that, the support is there. Um, and even, even if you want SSO, a lot of them make you pay 10 times the price to get it, which is ridiculous, but you know, yeah. So sadly, no easy answers for that, I'm afraid, but. Go for it. Yeah, so I mean that's that's definitely been a common thing in some incidents, uh, registering a new MFA device in some way. Um, I didn't cover that specifically in the presentation, but certainly that's been part of a lot of incidents that have been happening. Um, so yeah, you gain access to an account some way. Could be an attacker. I, I didn't really cover attacker in the middle proxy uh, attacks either, but it could be you know a SSO focused compromise. Um, to do an attacker in the middle proxy technique, get that one-time session control, yeah, and then add a new MFA method to then use your stolen password to then be able to log in again without it. That's definitely something that, that does happen in some of these attacks. Different. Uh, what is what what area do you think is uh, understudied or under-examined uh, in this uh, attack certain space? Where do you think? The whole thing, really. Uh, there's not that many people out there doing much in this space. So, um, yeah, because I, I think the, the difficulty is I've talked about some of these techniques, but then really, if you want to know how well they apply, it's not just doing it once. There's hundreds of SAS apps that you can then test to see how it is. So, like, even when you come up with a new technique, it's like you don't, it's so much work to find out how many people it applies to. And even like if you want to write a tool, if you want to write a recon tool, for example, to do SAML enumeration, something simple like that, you know, how many different SAS applications are you going to go and try and figure it out for and write a plugin for your SAML? So I think really just across the board, there is a huge amount of scope for other researchers to jump in and come up with new techniques or expand out the existing ones or write tooling to help, like red team tooling, blue team tooling. I just think the whole space is ripe for research. <laughs>